So, before you became CEO of Kujiba, uh, you started as the CEO of Enotech and then um, at Unicare. Um, so that's quite a broad range from what was a German service company to a Dutch gene therapy company. Um, what is the common thread here? The common thread is um, pretty simple. All three companies have great technology platforms and um, great scientists. And I just take a lot of um, fun in um, developing technology platform companies. And I prefer doing this when there's a lot of innovation at play, um, less so when you have kind of this mammoth organization and you need to run it on an operational basis. So it's just um, the fun part of that, and, and the three companies share the technology platforms and, and the great people, the great scientists. Mm -hmm. I see. So what, uh, across all these platform companies, what was the, I guess, the single biggest lesson that you took away from all of this? Oh, um, I, well, the, the, the biggest sort of um, event that I experienced was the approval of that era. And um, Glybera is the first gene therapy company that, um, that you know, the first gene therapy product that was ever approved. And um, some of you may know that we went through um, four iterations at the European Medicines Agency for getting it approved. And the biggest lesson is that even if you have the largest European authority in front of you, don't accept no for an answer. We didn't and we pushed the first gene therapy to be accepted um, to market. And I think that's the, the biggest accomplishment. I see. Um, you also told us in the previous interviews that, um, um, uh, you told us in the oh. previous, <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 You told us in the previous interview that a common pitfall uh, in biotech is to have really good science but no or bad financial strategy. Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit, particularly as far as lessons in biotech go? Yeah, I mean, my experience is really that if you don't have enough money, um, you can have great science, but you're trapped. And very often companies do not have enough water under the keel um, to actually get to their milestones, and then it gets very difficult to fund. And then you're kind of a downward spiral. Um, look at Ukipa. We, um, when I started a year and a half ago, set out to develop a great company. Um, we had a great plan, um, which was very ambitious and which needed quite a significant amount of money. Um, we started off on the plan, and at some point in time, you have to deliver on the finances. Otherwise, you have to stop, and the whole dynamic of development of the company um, goes away. And that is terrible in a biotech environment when people start to get sort of fearful about their jobs and so on, you've got the wrong atmosphere. So therefore I think um, having great science always need to be accompanied by um, a strong financial management that at least helps you to get beyond your next value inflection points um, to be able to refund. And, and here the lesson I think is take as much as you can at the moment you can take it because the money is going to go away anyway um, and you will need it if you continue to go. So um, at, at Kipa, we just um, closed a 50 million euro round, private. We spent nine months working on um, US investors in particular, and that was part of a very ambitious goal to run two clinical trials, one in infectious diseases and one in cancer. And, um, and in order to be able to show proof of concept of our technologies in those two trials, we need this amount of money. So we worked hard on it, got it done, and it was essential. Had we not taken on that money, we would have run the risk of not actually getting beyond those milestones and then get stuck. Okay. This is what you want to avoid. Got it. So uh, before I quiz you <laughs> on your value of inflection points, um, could you talk a little bit more about the technology for people who might not be familiar? You're working uh, in cancer, but also in infectious diseases, which is Again, quite a broad spread. So, could you explain how that works exactly and what distinguishes it from uh, other companies? Yeah, so we work on um, active immunization, and, um, and what we're doing is we are trying to drive two effects. One is an antibody response, and the second is a T cell response. And we're doing this, and, and this is and, it's not or. Many um, similar technologies mostly drive antibody responses. So we drive both, and, um, and we're doing it by targeting dendritic cells in vivo. 
Now, the, the cool thing about it is that the antibody responses are quite comparable to what you can see from our best competitors. The T cell responses are massive. They are comparable to something like TCR, so CAR Ts. And um, just to give you an illustration, what we can do in animals is we can turn 50% of all T cells in a mouse in an antigen specific way towards a single tumor. And we can completely control the tumor in those mice. Now, um, this again, the, the sheer um, power of these T cells, so these antigen specific T cells, are the same as CAR Ts. Um, but the technology is in vivo. It targets dendritic cells and activates the T cell in its natural mechanism. And therefore, you don't have what you have with CAR Ts, which is the ex vivo part and the, the difficult business model behind it, where you have to extract cells, manipulate them, bring them back into the patient. We don't have to do that. We inject systemically and kick off this chain. And, um, and with that, I think we have a fantastic technology which we've proven in a phase one CMV trial in infectious diseases where we have a very good antibody response and a um, second to none T cell response. And we're now preparing for our first clinical trial to, um, to, to show how this works in, in cancers. And everything we're seeing preclinically tells me it's going to work. We have seen peptide vaccines in combination with checkpoint inhibitors, and they double the effect of checkpoint inhibitors the peptides. We've done head-to-head -head peptide against our technology and we're a factor of X higher in terms of T-cell production. And this is why I think we, we have a really good chance in, in controlling tumors also in the human setting. I see. Um, it sounds very effective indeed, but um, have you seen any adverse events like um, some of the cytokine storms that occur with CAR-T or um, surely it's not all as rosy as it sounds? Well, because it's so antigen specific, and really targeted towards the tumor, we have not seen anything like cytokine release storms, um, as you see with other technologies. Okay. Um, okay, so then what, what has it been that makes uh, vaccine development so tough? Because there have been many failures, and then, uh, it seems like enthusiasm has waned, um, with some uh, CEOs who will remain unnamed calling them recycled wine. <laughs> How would you respond to something like that? Yeah, I think um, people are a bit behind the time. And um, something yeah. that I, I would um, remark is that whenever you have a new technology, you can see kind of a pattern that develops. And you've seen it with gene therapies, you've seen it with other technologies that came on antibodies. People get excited when they realize the potential of something. And the valuation and the interest and the publications go up like this. Then suddenly they realize that implementing this stuff is actually pretty difficult. And once that gets realized, you come back down and the valuations and the number of publications are actually almost negligible. And that goes on and gene therapy went on for 10 years at least. And at some point in time, people have actually gone through the effort to show that it works. And then you have rapid exponential growth. And I can tell you the stuff that we're doing is at this infection point where I can see it grow because we have shown that this technology works in humans and in infectious diseases, and we will show the same cancer. I see. Um, before we got started, you mentioned that uh, you weren't thinking about doing an IPO yet because you're doing so well. Uh, can you just explain the thought process behind that? And this goes back to what we were talking about with um, the value points that uh, the audience will, might not be familiar with. So, what uh, I'm trying to what I'm fishing for is a sense of the progress that you've made so far. Um, so if you could just explain like what that what that science translates to in terms of the business, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, what does the science translate into in terms of the business? Yeah, because it seems like on on that curve that you've drawn, like it's a, the science is in a really good place. Um, so how would you say characterize investor response, or um, uh, how well are you doing? Financially? <laughs> or or how, comfort, how well do you sleep at night? <laughs> well, um, I, I sleep fantastically well right now. <laughs> um, with um, more than 50 million euros on the bank account, that's pretty good. Um, but the issue is that every time you raise the amount of money in your bank account, you also get more ambitious, and therefore money just disappears quite quickly again. Um, now, on the, on the business model, um, I, I mean, if you look around the biotech space, the 
really cool biotech companies, the ones that were really successful, you named them Biogen, Gilead, um, Amylum, and so on, they have all one thing in common, which is that they're actually driving their own products to market. And they want to see revenues from marketed products. And this is our goal, which we will not accomplish in the next three years. So the way we're looking at our business is in three horizons. And the third horizon is actually commercializing products, and I would say that's beyond 2025. In between, we want to exploit our technology platform, and, um, and what we're doing, vector-based active immunization, uses vectors, and these vectors are actually modules that once they are approved, you can use with different antigens, which reduces time to development, um, to market, and reduces the regulatory efforts. And this modularity is something that we call our Horizon 2. Horizon 1, our business today, is very clear, very focused. It's a proof of concept for CMB in a phase 2 study in solid organ transplant. And it is a phase 1 study in HPV positive head and neck cancer, where we're trying to prove that what we've seen in, in infectious diseases also works in cancer. We're just running those two programs and a little bit of preclinical stuff. Okay. That's so the business. <laughs> so, uh, could, could you tease out what the overlap is between those two? So for, I, I don't think, I know there's at least one immunology expert in the audience, Melanie, or a former journalist. <laughs> but uh, what, what do those two things have in common? Because to me, as a chemist, I, everything in biology I would watch the moon around on PowerPoint slides. <laughs> um, but I, they don't all look the same anymore. But where, what is the overlap there that, uh, that your platform hinges on? So whether you're in infectious diseases or immune oncology, what we're trying to do is we're driving antigens in the body to get an immune reaction. And, and you're trying to provoke with that immune reaction that either you prevent disease by creating some kind of memory um, in the innate immune system, or you're trying, trying to use it for therapeutic purposes. Um, you're trying to, to use T cells in a targeted manner to start to control the tumor. So you have those, those two aspects. Um, both are using exactly the same technologies. And, um, and it is a viral vector-based um, delivery vehicle in which you can put in antigens that you drive into the body to provoke that antibody and T-cell response. Got it. Uh, but so technology-based is basically identical. OK, so uh, at least uh, where I was going with this was that CMV seems very specific. Uh, <laughs> as opposed to uh, another virus. So it was just that uh, this happened to be the right institution for the technology, um, for, and the same thing for cancer, or was it just, uh, I guess I was just curious like if they actually had very similar technologies, or if they were just uh, two appropriate targets for the technology. Um, CMV clearly um, has shown that um, to really protect patients, antibody responses are not enough. That we know. The second thing we know is that CMV is a huge market um, opportunity. Uh, it's, it's massive. The, the number of CMV infections, um, the congenital infection, the protection um, before congenital infection is critical and is a billion dollar market if you, if you want. So that obviously was important. Um, the, the question on the technology side, antibodies alone don't do the trick. And our technology can do antibodies and T cells. And we're expecting that with the combination of antibody and T cell responses, we can actually get um, a better result. That's the hypothesis. Okay, I see. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think I'll move on from, that simple, or from the actual science part in a minute. I will be opening this up to the audience um, in a couple minutes or so uh, if anybody wants to jump in with questions. Um, but I've got one more in this arena. <laughs> and so what, what do you see as the major gaps uh, in vaccine development so far? Because it seems like, well, there is a massive gap. So, but what needs to be done in order for the field to take off at this point? Yeah, so I think that there, there are two things. Um, one is what I just mentioned. It is in, in many therapeutic um, areas, you need antibodies and T cells, um, or you at least need T cells in many therapeutic areas, and our technology can drive both. The, the gap here is that um, just creating antibody responses works in certain conditions, but not all the time. And, and this is something that lacks. Um, the second thing I would like to repeat, and I mentioned it also before, 
Um, in gene therapy, you've seen that this concept works, which is that if you have a virus that transports something into the body, um, and this virus is, is seen to be safe and, um, and has gone through the whole regulatory process, you can easily imagine that you can stick different passengers into that vehicle. You just exchange the passenger to another one in, and that will dramatically reduce the, um, the ability of, um, reduce the, the um, development times and development costs and will allow us to build a broader um, portfolio. I, I think those are the, the key things. There's maybe something else. Um, the number of antigens that you can use in a virally driven um, area or in a, in a setting which is determined by cell antigens is limited. And here, what you can see is that quite a number of companies are um, developing approaches of, of what they call neoantigens. Um, we would call them, and those are patient specific. What we will be looking for is shared next generation antigens. It's the same concept. It is something that you have basically isolated from tumor tissue in, in patients. Um, a number of proteins that you know um, are commonly overexpressed in um, certain cancers and target those. So the personalization, getting away from the virally driven and, and the self antigen driven cancers, um, the personalization is, is one of the gaps that I think we want to close to get better results in, in more um, disease settings. Sweet. Uh, it's interesting that you bring up personalized medicine because that's, uh, well, going back to how we were talking about energy strategy, that's an area that makes some people nervous uh, with um, how do you, uh, given the governments tend to focus on population health and uh, reimbursement models for individual therapies, uh, how, how do you envision making that business case? Do you think it'd be a challenge or? In, in vaccines? Uh, yeah, or personalized medicine broadly. Are there stuff, or do you think it'll be easy for vaccines, but uh, harder in other areas, or? Um, Not sure if I get the question. Uh, so, uh, since we were just talking about, um, it's important to have a good financial strategy along with good science. Um, and uh, since you just brought up uh, personalized medicine, I was wondering um, how you see that business case going, because, uh, for instance, somebody at Medellin just told me that Frankly, it doesn't have a business case yet, but their product is very easy to manufacture. Um, do you see that being uh, how similar is your situation to theirs, or uh, what challenges do you see on the horizon? Yeah. So, um, I mean, looking at what people talk about when they talk neo antigens, I think that's actually going to be quite difficult, and the key thing will be to be really cheap in the sense of being able to detect the specific mutations. Um, that, you, that you're targeting, and you have to have a mechanism by which you can um, very rapidly produce at very low cost. Um, that, that, from my perspective, is quite a challenge, and I'm not sure if anybody sort of has finished that, that thought process. Um, what we're looking for is um, shared next generation antigens, which are kind of between the, the ones the virally driven or self antigens and the, and the personalized, the, the specific for individuals. And here, I think um, the business case will be somewhat similar to what you're seeing with more traditional vaccines. Um, I think I've been in the, um, in the gene therapy space for quite some time and have worked on, on pricing models for gene therapies. And, um, and initially, when I started off in gene therapy, everybody said, um, gene therapy is never going to work. And if it does work, you will never get it um, reimbursed for um, satisfactory prices. Now, at this point in time, companies are actually coming back with price, um, price models that become acceptable, both in the US and in Europe. And the example is um, a company called Spark, um, who have this retinal um, RP65 gene therapy. And, um, and they have a model by which they, they take money over time and, and reimburse if things don't show any clinical benefit. And, um, and they have actually, with some formularies, already agreed pricing strategies that I think will be um, in relation to the cost they have for this therapy and for the development cost, will help give them a profitable business model. Why am I saying this? Everybody said it does work in gene therapy. It, it, it's just a question of, of um, human creativity that gets us to the point where the difficulties are overcome. And the same will be true in the business models for what we're doing here. Um, 
in, in the active immunization space. Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's continue here. Um, so, uh, does anyone have any questions so far? Um, okay. Uh, can you shout or? I can. Okay. <laughs> sure. um, so, talking about uh, cancer surface markers, those are incredibly sought after. Um, how do you navigate this, the space of uh, pathogens? Markers? Yeah, cancer surface markers. So we, I, um, I cannot give you an answer for this at, at this point. It's, um, it's not um, relevant for us um, right now. What we're trying to do is get the strongest T cell response we can possibly get to control the tumor, and we're going after tumors that are well described um, and that you can identify without using markers. So. Um, it's it's not a bottleneck for us at this point. Okay, I saw a ten of the hand. Is that enough? Uh, so one question is how much money would you need to invest to get the right fifty million? In other words, to get the right of the existing one. <laughs> yeah, so how much did we need? I think um, we raised um, twenty seven million euros um, in the series A and B and topped it up to 37. And we had um, an additional 11, which we received from FFG and, and sources here in, in Austria. So roughly 50 million. And that got us to the data that convinced people to give us another 50 million. Well, uh, <laughs> just happened on the virus antigen. Yeah, it's called P76, well described in, in literature. Um, actually, quite a lot of people working on it. We have selected it because we are, um, I, I shouldn't say in, in drug development, nothing is certain. Um, but knowing what we know about this antigen and the use of alternative technologies um, with a much more potent technology, we should be able to establish um, a validation for our technology. And I, I would call um, HPV positive um, the, the, um, the disease, the virally driven cancer, as the relatively low hanging fruit in this center. And with it, we will be able to fund the company again in an IPO or um, some other um, larger private setting. Having tackled the cell antigen, I'm personally pretty certain that we can tackle those too. Um, but the risk of not showing um, significant and great results immediately is much higher. So that's our second target in cancer. We'll be um, working on prostate cancer um, and, and using three different antigens, PAP, PSMA, and PSA, um, in, in one vaccine setting. Uh, I have a question. Do you think, I mean, considering the cancer field and conventional chemotherapy, which is applied to the specific area, do you think your, your approach as a potential to synergize with the conventional chemotherapy, or do you see your approach as a substitute? Um, so we have not used, um, yes, we have in animals, we've used um, chemotherapy and vaccine combinations, and we've seen synergies there. Um, we're also seeing that something that is currently um, highly rated in the scientific community and amongst um, medical doctors is the checkpoint inhibitors. And, um, and we can see that in, in certain instances, checkpoints and inhibitors work fantastically well, for example, in melanoma. In others, they don't at all. And the reason why they don't work is because they're lacking T cells. We know that combining in melanoma, um, our technology with checkpoint inhibitors gives you, gives you fabulous results in, in moments where checkpoint inhibitors by themselves don't deliver anything. And, and there is a combination. We also know that if you, if you apply chemotherapy first and you put a vaccine on top, a strong vaccine, you also get a synergistic effect. Um, this is actually, um, I mean, we, we do see strong effects with our technology in cancer also in monotherapy applications, but we do think that the majority of cancers in the future will definitely take combinations. So various drugs and, and the combi chemo vaccine is clearly one. Um, you could you could see the checkpoint inhibitors. You could potentially also think about um, CAR Ts. If 
I may follow up on this. You mentioned immune checkpoints and neuron more. There's been recent uh, research which shows that the response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in neuron more uh, can be predicted by the variety of microbiome patients. So uh, do you see the role, potential of studying microbiome in the future uh, you know, immune oncology uh, I, I will not answer this. I'm not a scientist, and, um, and we have not worked on, on microbiome technologies, so I um, just don't know. Um, actually, I can possibly say something about that. So, BMS just went into a partnership with Enteron in France, I think it was last year, or maybe even the year before. Um, so, that does seem like an active area of investigation, but that's the best validation that I've seen so far. Um, did you also have a question? Yes. Um, uh, you mentioned that you are planning to use or using the vector uh, as a delivery system of the, the viral vector. Do you see in your first in human trials that it would restrict you in the uh, population in terms of having the neutralized antibodies or in a certain population it won't be uh, unimaginable to a trial? So how do you see approaching it? Yeah, this is a great question. So it helps me to bring over a point which is differentiating a lot of technology that um, I haven't mentioned so far. Um, the technology we're using is called an arena virus. And arena viruses have um, a glycan shield which protects them on the outside. And this glycan shield leads to the fact that they're sort of not, um, not influenced by neutralizing antibodies. So what we've shown is that um, when you have an SIV model, so the, the um, primate HIV model, and you apply this in a prime boost format, we have boosted five times with the same construct, non-neutralizing antibodies. And, um, and that obviously is fantastic if you think of, of, um, of infectious diseases where you use this kind of vaccine and you have to boost um, and you can use the same product. Your regulatory process is much shorter. You only have one manufacturing process and, and one product, which is great. So neutralizing antibodies don't seem to be an issue with our technology. Perfect, great. And may I just ask a follow-up question? Um, how do you see uh, yourself start partnering up with the big players uh, to get rid of their, you know, case quickly and get to the market? And how do you see a business case and a business model for that? Or you want to do it all by yourself? Yeah. So um, we we have made a decision of um, deprioritizing infectious diseases and, and concentrating on cancer. Um, that was when we were still sort of thinking about a bank account of 20 to 30 million. Um, now with more money, this has changed and we're investing more in both infectious diseases and cancer. Um, do we want a partnership? Um, at some point in time, it is for biotech always very helpful to have a partnership in place. But having Gurunga Ingenhan, Takeda, and Gilead investors in the company on a corporate level is already some kind of validation. And um, some of our US crossover investors are very deep pocketed and, and say, if you can, please don't partner. Now, um, what are we going to do? Um, my, my own philosophy is hold on to things as long as you can because value increases over time. Um, but I could see that we can broaden our portfolio earlier than planned today if we partner on the infectious disease side.